Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 2 to 17. So the ark remained at Kirath, Jerem, a long time, 20 years in all. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the asterisks and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their bells and asterisks and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted and, they, and they, they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord, our God, for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took the sucking lamb and sacrificed it as an old burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew up near to engage Israel in battle. At that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were rooted before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to point below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued as they stopped invading Israel, Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron and Gath, Ekron to Gath, that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel. And Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gigal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah where his home was, and there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord. Amen. Before we come to God's words, let's just spend a, a moment in prayer together. <coughs> Gracious God, our Father, you have spoken to your people down the ages through the judges and the prophets and then in these last days in the person of your son. And we thank you that you still speak today through the Holy Spirit whom you have given to your people. And so we ask that today we would be ready to hear and receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I bet you didn't know that Samuel was a doctor, did you? We are told in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 7 that he was a leader of Israel, and in verse 15, that he was a judge over Israel, but a doctor? Surely not. Well, I admit I'm stretching the point a bit. But there is no doubt from what we're told in this chapter that if there was any one person 
who had care of the spiritual health of Israel, God's chosen people, it was Samuel. And as we've been hearing, as we've looked at the early chapters of this book together, this was a time when all was not well with the spiritual health of God's people. There wasn't yet a king. We'll be coming shortly to chapters 8 and 9 where we'll find out how God, how the people kept demanding a king and how eventually Saul was chosen for that role. But in these early chapters, we're still in the era of the judges. The very last verse of the book of Judges tells us in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Now, everyone choosing to live just as they see fit is not a recipe for physical health and well-being. If I see fit to eat a Big Mac and fries every day and never take any exercise, it won't be long before I need to go to the doctor and I'll be sure to receive a ticking off. Exactly the same principle applies to our spiritual health. Doing exactly as we see fit without any guidance or direction from a spiritual doctor is a recipe for a spiritual form of obesity and decline, maybe even leading to spiritual death. Now, we've not been able to look in detail at chapter 6, but I'm going to give you a brief summary of chapter 6 before moving on to chapter 7. And at first sight, these are not particularly easy chapters. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> They're applicability to our Christian lives today may not appear immediately obvious. But I believe when we read them carefully, they carry some important messages for the people of God, whether that's the people of Israel in a historical sense, or whether it's the expanded new Israel of today into which God has called us. So, a brief overview of chapter 6, first of all. Chapter 6 is all about how the Philistine, Philistines decided to send back the Ark of the Covenant. The box, which was the symbol of the awesome, holy presence of the God of Israel. They captured it, thinking that if they captured it, that would guarantee their national health but actually they learned the hard way that stealing sacred goods wasn't a blank check guaranteeing national health. On the contrary, chapter 6 tells us that it led to a disastrous outbreak of plague spread by rats, like the Black Death. So the Philistines decided we've had enough of this. We're going to send the ark trundling back to where it really belongs, to Israel. So they... They stuck it on the back of a bullock cart and they said, the bullocks, off you go. And one autumn day, when some Israelites were living on the border with Philistine territory in a place called Beth Shemesh, they were looking up from their harvesting in the fields and they got the surprise of their lives when they saw the bullocks, led only by divine satnav, or perhaps we should say bovine satnav. Heading straight for them. Well, that sounds like good news. But this good news turned to tra tragedy when 70 of the people of that uh, settlement, Beth Shemesh, let their curiosity get the better of them. They did exactly as they saw fit. They decided to take a peek into the inside of the ark, something expressly forgiven forbidden in the law of Moses. And tragically, they paid for their presumption with their lives. We're told that all Israel mourned for them. So the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh said, enough of this, we're going to hand the ark on to our neighbors. 
let them have this uncomfortable symbol of God's holy presence in their midst. So they send it 10 miles down the road to kiriath Jearim. That's chapter 6. As I said, these are not easy chapters. Chapter 6 reminds us that God is so much more than just nice. Rather, he is a consuming fire whose perfect holy love burns in searching judgment on all human attempts to buy, buy his favour. We can't purchase it. God's rich blessing, the grace of forgiveness, is not to be purchased cheaply. It's not to be taken for granted. It reaches us only at an infinite cost, which God himself has paid in the person of his son. As a result, we can draw near to God in confidence, but only if we remember that none of us can stand in the presence of this holy God confident in our own righteousness. And that's the verse at the end of chapter 6 that really makes that point. Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? Now for chapter 7. The narrator leaves us in no doubt that Israel was still far from healthy. That morning that began when the 70 men of Beth Shemesh met their deaths obviously went on for years, possibly for as long as 20 years, verse 2. Israel was a long-term patient who waited a very long time for healing of her spiritual sickness. So let's imagine Israel finally being ushered into Dr. Samuel's surgery with the time-honored phrase for doctor will see you now. But of course, it wasn't uh, Samuel who had kept them waiting. It was Israel who had kept Samuel and God waiting. I wonder what Dr. Samuel has to say to us. What's his diagnosis for us? What's on his prescription? Well, here's the first item on the list. And unlike many doctors' prescriptions in the good old days before computers, the writing is easy to read. The message from the doctor is absolutely plain. Don't just talk about repentance. Do it. So we're in the surgery. So what seems to be the problem, Dr. Samuel asked the patient. Well, doctor, for years and years we've been struggling with a tax. Tax from the Philistines next door, and they just won't go away. Even though we've got our ark back, the situation hasn't improved. We've carried on mourning the deaths of 70 of our folk at Beth Shemesh. We've cried out again and again to the Lord to help us Yet nothing seems to have changed. We've tried everything to restore our health as a nation. We've even asked for local Canaanite gods, Baal and Ashtoreth, to lend a hand as well, because they're supposed to guarantee our health and prosperity. Stop right there, says Samuel. Stop right there. What you just said has told me the root of your problem. Having statues in your homes of Baal and Ashtoreth won't help you. Fight the reverse. Now, who are these figures, Baal and Ashtoreth? Let's step out of the surgery for a moment and find out a little bit about them. Baal was the male Canaanite deity, a muscular gladiator sort of figure who was supposed to guarantee perpetual victory in battle. Ashtoreth, or Ashtoreth, it's sometimes spelt, was his sexy girlfriend, who was supposed to guarantee fertility. Bow down to Baal, and you'll be powerful. You will crush your enemies every time. Kneel before Ashtoreth, and you'll have lots of healthy children, and so you will be rich. So you will be rich? 
That's rather different from our society, isn't it, in which children cost money. <laughs> and the more you have, the greater the strain on the poor bank balance. But we have to understand, in biblical times, and indeed in many parts of the world still today, it worked the other way around. Fertility appeared to guarantee prosperity. The more kids you had, the more cheap labor you got to work your fields. And the better the chances that some would survive into your old age to look after you when there was no NHS. So worship of Baal and Ashtoreth appeared to promise endless victory, power, and prosperity. But it was a hollow promise. Let's go back into the surgery and find out what Dr. Samuel is prescribing for us. Verse 3, Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths, can commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Here's the medicine. It's not enough to keep hammering on God's door and seeking his grace if at the same time you are seeking other false security, the security offered by Baal and Ashtoreth. What you have to do is to be prepared to get rid of all your idols and rely on God alone. Don't just talk about repentance, do it. I wonder, does all this talk of these ancient Canaanite gods of power and prosperity sound a bit remote, not very relevant? I wonder. Or is it in fact strangely familiar? We live in a society which worships power and prosperity. And sadly, there are some churches today that appear to make very similar false promises. The way for your church to flourish and enjoy total spiritual victory is to give your leaders unlimited power. I've heard that. The way for you to become rich personally, individually, is to give these great men of God more and more money to use as they alone see fit. We shouldn't be taken in. These are the tempting Christian versions of Baal and Ashtoreth today. But this sort of pseudo-spiritual contract is not the way to spiritual health and fruitfulness. There's no belt and braces approach when we come to seek God's power. It's got to be dependence on God alone, not on some sort of business contract we signed to purchase God's blessing. The Christian life is not a business contract in which if we do A, B, and C, God is obliged to pay us back by doing X, Y, and Z. Christian discipleship is not a contract. The Bible uses the term covenant, a family relationship of faithfulness in which our response to God's prior initiative of grace is to turn away from every false source of security and give him the first place in our hearts. That's costly. It involves continual repentance, continual rededication and trust. The great German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, in which he talked about cheap grace as opposed to costly grace. What did he mean by cheap grace? This is his answer. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. There's a big difference between costly grace and cheap grace. Verses 5 and 6 record that the Israelites took 
the medicine Samuel pres prescribed, the medicine of costly grace. They poured out water before the Lord. That was an outward sign of their need for cleansing. They confessed their sin, and then they threw the statues, statues of Baal and Ashtoreth out of their homes. They were no longer just talking about repentance, they were doing it. Verses 7 to 11 record how God honoured their repentance with his blessing and victory over the Philistines. So that's the first and maybe the most important uh, item on Dr. Samuel's prescription. There was a second item. Verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. Second point, really, is keep a record of God's faithfulness. To mark the victory over the Philistines, Samuel erected a large stone near the battle site and gave it a name, a name that may sound a bit quaint to us, Ebenezer. If you go around Wales, you'll find quite a lot of chapels still called Ebenezer. It was once a popular name among Christian families. Not any longer. Abigail, yes, Louis, yes, but Ebenezer... I think not. Maybe Charles Dickens had something to do with that. Who wants to name their children after Ebenezer Scrooge? Well, we used to sing a hymn written by a famous Baptist pastor in Cambridge called Robert Robinson. Come thou fount of every blessing. In which the second verse started with these lines. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Ever by thy help I'm come. I thought about singing it this morning, but decided not. Some of you may have sung it and wondered just what it meant or where this quaint word came from. It literally means, as we've heard, stone of help. But the narrator gives a slightly looser translation. Thus far has the Lord helped us. So it was a memorial stone erected to remind the Israelites not just of the victory they had just won in battle, but also of the one who had given, the, given them that victory, the Lord himself. It was a permanent record in stone, a solid, irremovable reminder whenever you pass by, a constant reminder of God's faithfulness, but also of the fact that victory at Mizpah had come following an act of corporate repentance. Yes, it was a silent lump of rock, yet it spoke a clear message. The message was that when the people finally swallowed that medicine of absolute trust and costly repentance prescribed by Dr. Samuel, recovery of health had followed. So what's the second item on Dr. Samuel's prescription? Not another set of tablets, but simply a note in bold print reminding us of God's faithfulness and the need to keep on taking the daily pills, the daily medicine of resolving to trust him alone for today. The great China missionary, James Hudson Taylor, erected two banners on the wall of his first church in China. The banners had two Hebrew phrases written on them in, of course, Chinese script. One was Ebenezer, from 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. The other was from Genesis 22, 14. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. The Lord has provided, the Lord will provide. They became the mottos of the great mission he founded on the principles of trusting God alone, the China Inland Mission, which now is the OMF, the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. If we're going to experience the wonder of God's faithful provision and walk from day to day in repentance and trust, we need regular reminders, as Rosie was reminding us in, in the All Aid spot. Keep a record of God's faithfulness. 
Maybe list God's answers to your prayers in a notebook. Maybe even on a, your kitchen notice board. Raise your Ebenezer where you can see it. Now we're on our way out of a doctor's surgery. But just before we leave, Dr. Samuel has a word of advice for us. By the way, he says, you may have noticed that in my very demanding life doing the rounds in Israel as a circuit judge or GP, if you like, I make sure that I set aside time every year to go back home to Rama, to where I was brought up, back to my wife and family. I do recommend it. It's not all holiday. I'm afraid I still have to hear my cases even when I'm home. Do try it. Why did Samuel ensure that he spent time every year back home in Rama? Well, the narrator doesn't tell us explicitly, but I think we can pick up one or two hints. First, Rama was where his wife, Mrs. Samuel, we don't know her name, and their two sons, we do know their names, Joel and Abijah, lived. They didn't accompany him on his rounds as a circuit judge traveling around the country. And sadly, it seems that Samuel paid a price for so much time spent on the Lord's work that separated from his family. Just looking forward to verse 3 of chapter 8. His sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Maybe Samuel should have spent even more time at home. Second, Rama was where he was born and brought up by godly parents, Elkanah and Hannah. Rama was where the barren Hannah had received God's gracious answer to her prayer, where she had conceived Samuel, the child of promise. So Rama was a place where the one true God was honored and reverenced when much of the country was turning away from him. No wonder Samuel warned Israel about the idolatrous worship of the false goddess of fertility, Ashtoreth, because his own mother had been barren, had lost all hope of conceiving, and Hannah turned only to God, to Yahweh, the one true God who can bestow new life. I believe that's why Samuel built an altar to Yahweh there. That was the focus of his devotion to God alone. But maybe it's not too much of a stretch to suggest, well, now Samuel knew what his limits were. He had to carry on acting as a judge even when he was back home in Rama, we're told really difficult cases he had to, uh, had to adjudicate on and follow up on, no doubt. But he also knew that once a year he needed to recharge his batteries, physically and spiritually. And as Samuel did, I guess that's true of us as well. Maybe more than once a year. We may not all have the same battery life. We don't all have the long-range battery of a Tesla. Some of us have. Some of us start running out after 100 miles. In an increasingly busy and growing church, some of us might need recharging more often than others. And we should all respect our sisters and brothers whose battery life might be a bit more limited than ours. We can't all be Teslas. So here are three more vital principles of spiritual health. Respect the needs of your family. Revisit 
places which remind you of God's grace and faithfulness and recharge your batteries regularly in whatever way you find most helpful. And above all, as we close, let's remember what the central message of this chapter is. Don't just talk about repentance, do it. If day by day we place our trust in God alone, then we will know in our own experience that the Lord has helped us, Ebenezer, and he will go on helping us. Jehovah Jireh. Amen.